that high that you get um, from being able to you know, contribute is, is really wonderful. So thank you. Um, I'm now gonna introduce Rhonda, who is going to take over the MC role for the afternoon. Um, for all of you, this is Rhonda Connolly, who is um, a founding member of National PKUA and also a board member and an executive committee member. Um, so the next two sessions before dinner or drinks is a um, panel discussion with our 2021 funded researchers and then what's new in PKU. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Rhonda. Thank you. And I get to talk about one of my favorite things and that's the exciting research going on and the grants that we've been funding every year. I am on the uh, scientific advisory committee as the chair and have been for the past few years. And I've been on the board for the past, well, since inception. So, but my, the grants are my passion. And so today we're going to hear from the six that we had from, or five that we had from last year, which totaled over $376,000. I'm, I'm echoing, aren't I? <laughs> $376,000 last year. And uh, we are also, for this year, going to be awarding another 435,000 for new grants. So today though, we're here to talk about the ones. So everybody who is now on our, this can come up to the panel. So I think what we'll do is have each of them present their study of the grant that we funded, and then we'll open it up for some questions and answers. One, two, three, four, five. Everybody's here. So I'm gonna get out of the way. And my list says we're gonna start with Dr. Stephen I'm going to say this wrong, even though I'm Polish. Dombrowski. Uh, close. <laughs> you can come to the podium, yes. How do you do? My name's uh, Stephen Dobrowski. I am the medical director of biochemical genetics at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, and professor of pathology at the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. I always forget that part. Um, we've all seen this. This is the model that has been largely used to describe the uh, pathophysiology of uh, PKU neurologic disease. And it follows phenylalanine from the liver into the blood and then across the blood-brain barrier through the LAT1 transporter. And this leads to an overrepresentation of cerebral phenylalanine with underrepresentation of other amino acids that in turn leads to a uh, paucity of neurotransmitters and other um, other elements. I want to speak about things that have nothing to do with the transport uh, or uh, the blood-brain barrier, but underappreciated pathophysiological elements in PKU, um, specifically tissue-specific energy deficit and tissue-specific oxidative stress. Evidence of tissue-specific energy deficit is not new. I mean, we look at this paper right here. Look, it uses the old nomenclature for PKU, phenylpyruvic oligopherinia, from 1940. Um, here we have data from the 1970s um, involving uh, fee metabolism, the fee catabolite phenylpyruvate, and... Uh, its implication in uh, neurologic disease. Something a little more recent, 2002, showing uh, mitochondrial respiratory chain deficit in uh, the PKU rat model. And here's one of my own publications from just this year, 
that uh, used some very different techniques, including respirometry, uh, oximetry, metabolomics, to identify um, cerebral energy deficit and oxidative stress. Now, evidence of PKU brain energy dysregulation. This is something that happens in something called a mitochondria, which is within a cell is the generator of energy. And this is the so-called respiratory chain. Um, we don't have a pointer, do we? Okay, well, I can point. Um, these data shown below show metabolomic data from PKU liver and PKU brain and PKU plasma from the PAH Inu2 mouse. And uh, the most relevant things here are, it says NADH, niacinamide adenine dinucleotide, um, and NAD. But if you look at NADH in the liver and below it, NAD, those numbers are essentially the same as what the controls were. There was no difference was realized. But if you move over to where it says brain, you can see that the molecule NADH is highly overrepresented and the molecule NAD is underrepresented. Now, if we look up at the uh, drawing above the whole way to the left, you can see that what is called respiratory complex one metabolizes NADH to NAD. And this is an indication that there is a deficiency in this energy generating component of the mitochondria respiratory chain. This is something called uh, respirometry. And what this does is it Again, from the picture at the top, it measures the, end, the uh, first complex the whole way to the left, then the next one over, which the one to the left is called complex one, the one immediately to the right of it is called complex two. Um, but it measures those two um, complexes. Now, the blue trace is the control. The red trace is from uh, PKU mouse brain tissue. Now notice that where the little carrot, it says PYR, that stands for pyruvate, which was applied to the mitochondria and the PKU brain did not respond fully to the pyruvate induction. Now, the next step up also induces complex one um, that uses a, a different um, energy substrate called glutamate. Now, aside from starting at a lower baseline, the response between the PKU and the uh, control are very much the same. And then whenever we um, stimulate the second complex using another substrate, succinate, we're essentially exactly where we are with the uh, other one. So this is an indication that the pyruvate induced energy uh, is deficient in the PKU brain. Um, let's go back to that for a second. Come on, there we go. Um, the thing about this is we looked at this in the PKU brain we looked at it in PKU liver, we looked at it in PKU muscle, we looked at it in brain of the maternal PKU syndrome. We also looked at this in the stem cells of the bone uh, relevant to the PKU osteopenia phenotype. And in the affected tissues, brain and bone, brain from both PKU and maternal PKU syndrome, we saw exactly the same profile, identical. In the mesenchymal stem cells from the bone phenotype, we saw the same profile, identical. In the liver, the red would have been right on top of the blue. In the muscle, the red was right on top of the blue. In those tissues, there was no evidence for a complex one energy deficit. And um, so we are, I'll show some 
more data on this uh, tomorrow in the longer talk. But there is another aspect of energy deficit called oxidative stress. Um, now here we show brain reactive oxygen species in PAH ENU2 versus control. And as you can see, the, um, relative, the level of oxidative stress is high in PKU. And here we do the same thing in the mesenchymal stem cells, again, relevant to the PKU osteopenia phenotype. And again, it is very, very high compared to the control. And this is, a, this is a, a little more complex one right here. We were looking in the maternal PKU syndrome, but what we did was we disassociated the brain tissue, because you can do that in uh, fetal brain tissue where you really can't in um, developed brain tissue. And this specifically looked at a category of cells that were CD45 positive. I know this is really gibberish, but, uh, but what it identified was something called microglia. And these were experiencing oxidative stress. And the same thing is seen in classical neurologic diseases, Huntington's disease. It's seen in ALS. It is seen in Alzheimer's disease. Not to say that these diseases are like PKU, they're fundamentally different, but not to say that there couldn't be a common final pathway leading to the neurologic dysfunction among them. And, uh, Origins of superoxide, well, look where it comes from. It comes from complex one. We were talking about complex one earlier with the respirometry, the red versus the blue profile. Um, it's, a, it's coming from the same place. And uh, the relevance of PKU energy dysregulation. Um, in untreated, poorly in untreated PKU and in the maternal PKU syndrome, we see microcephaly, small heads. That is relevant to energy and relevant to growth. Um, the PAH ENU2 mouse, its brain, the size of the brain is unresponsive to dopamine modulation. If dopamine was the whole story, it might see that, but we don't see that. This is an energy issue. Treatment responsive white matter lesions in PKU. It grows. We bring down the burden of the uh, energy dysregulation and we see a response. The brain is 2% of the body weight. It uses 20% of the energy. You dysregulate brain energy and you're going to have problems. And this is seen, as I, as I mentioned, some of those other classical neurologic diseases, that uh, this is part of the pathophysiology of them. And it's also part of the pathophysiology of PKU, and we're not treating this. And I say we need to modify our treatments to provide the necessary energy substrates to the affected tissue, and more on that tomorrow. But I think that's the end of me. Oh, yeah, I am. So let's back up, that's someone else's. Um, but thank you very much, I appreciate having been here and uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them now or are we doing that at the end? We're gonna do that at the end. At the end, so I will bid you goodbye. And next we have Dr. Eric Coppins. Hi, uh, thanks. Thank you for inviting me here. And I'm um, Dr. Eric Kopis. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, University of Pittsburgh and uh, sponsored by um, the NPKUA. Um, I work under uh, Dr. Robert Nichols and Dr. Jerry Vockley. And uh, oh, we're still on uh, Steve's slides. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about some of my work on developing new models of PKU. So what are uh, biological models? Uh, they're systems in which we can study uh, the pathophysiology and disease progression in a controlled environment. So um, you can do uh, things you can, can't do with uh, patients. Uh, you can like, spike them with fee or, um, you know, do, um, 
A uh, very uh, complicated uh, uh, work on, on different model systems. So anyway, uh, there's, there's a number of uh, models already uh, in existence, including uh, the PKU mice, uh, notably ENU1 and ENU2. So these are point mutations and uh, some of them, uh, ENU2 and specifically has a kind of classical PKU phenotype with high phi, um, it's kind of BH tetrahydrobrotrin, uh, not responsive and has been uh, well studied, uh, but the neurological and neurobehavioral phenotypes are, are somewhat modest. Uh, most notably, they have uh, kind of learning deficits and some executive functioning reasoning. Um, but we really need uh, a new model systems uh, that are, are closer to humans in terms of their basic physiology, their size and their metabolism. Um, so we've worked to develop a, a PKU pig model. Um, I've also spent some time working on generating patient specific models uh, using a cell line uh, to first delete pH, uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, and then uh, introduce new variants that are um, able to recapitulate um, the compound heterozygosity that is often found in PKU patients. Oops, wrong green button. Um, so what, why, are, why are pigs a good model for PKU? Well, they're, their size and their metabolism is much more similar than say a mouse is to human. Uh, they have a similar brain uh, uh, development. Um, they're about one-tenth the size of the brain, but it develops postnatally in the same uh, progressive order. And they uh, have uh, amendable to genome and engineering. Um, it's kind of really come along in the past decade. So we, we set out to use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Um, so this is a technology that was originally discovered by Jennifer Duna and Emmanuel Chapentier, who won the uh, 2020 Nobel Prize. Um, it's a, a bacterial defense mechanism against bacteriophages, but it's been adapted to be used in mammalian cells. Um, uh, basically use a, a, a guide RNA that's complementary to a sequence in DNA, so you can make breaks in the DNA uh, anywhere you desire. Um, kind of, so it's kind of a programmable way to cut DNA. And if you make uh, two such cuts, um, as I showed in the upper right of the screen, you actually can delete intervening regions. Um, you can also get inversions and duplications, but uh, we were aiming to get deletions of a critical region of exon uh, six of pH. And uh, exon six has a number, a huge number of mutations that are possible. I mean, pH uh, itself has just a incredible a diversity of, of different mutations. So, uh, and there's even a, a couple of reports of exon six or exon six seven being uh, deleted uh, in full in, in a PKU patient. So, uh, we chose to delete that. Um, and to do this, uh, we used uh, we injected uh, CRISPR Cas uh, CRISPR guide RNAs and uh, Cas9 messenger RNA into a, a, a fertilized zygote. Um, to do in vivo genome editing. This was with our collaborators at the University of Missouri and the National Swine Research and Resource Center. And then the, we screened the uh, uh, resulting blastocysts by PCR and roughly half of them had genome editing events. Uh, we then actually got two founding PKU pigs. One of them was affected, uh, she was homozygous. Uh, she had one deletion, which was exon six as expected and one with uh, an exon 6-7 deletion, so it was a little bit larger. Um, it resulted from uh, microhomology mediated repair. And uh, we were able to confirm this by a few different methods, including uh, droplet digital PCR and whole genome sequencing. And the, the PKU pig phenotype uh, we then established had, um, of course, uh, extremely high levels of feed, but uh, the affected animal was also hypopigmented and had, um, uh, growth restriction postnatally. So she kind of fell behind in growth uh, despite feeding pretty similarly. Um, eventually caught up, uh, uh, they were initially at the University of Missouri, but then we brought them to Pittsburgh and we uh, fed them a, lot, a little bit more and they, she caught up. Um, and then uh, the dietary, we did a dietary intervention uh, on the affected animal and brought her feed levels from uh, upwards of 5,000 micromolars. So just extremely off the charts uh, down to the normal range within two weeks using a no-fee diet. 
And that followed, um, we eventually dialed in the diet to about 85% fee-free chow. So it really proved that uh, the PKU pig model can be used uh, to kind of study PKU, uh, at least uh, at the uh, biochemical level. Uh, we did an MRI study, and, and keep in mind, this is only an N of one, um, and I have a type one here. It's actually a decreased cortical gray matter that we saw in uh, ventricular megaly. Um, but this is a comparison of uh, two age-matched pigs are affected PKU at about six months, um, and a, a pig from another breed, so we had to kind of normalize back to the uh, relative brain size. Um, but this is kind of a preliminary finding in, in our publication. Um, we were also able to try to use the uh, PKU pig to breed the uh, affected animal um, off diet and, and resulted in a litter of uh, PKU piglets, uh, or maternal PKU piglets. And um, we had uh, five that were born uh, live. Uh, there was one stillborn and one that was uh, kind of uh, spontaneously aborted and, and reabsorbed, um, which we don't necessarily know the phenotypes of. These had uh, some variability in terms of their size and uh, kind of biomorphic measurements like a head circumference, and, and we're still working to analyze their behavior. Uh, but otherwise, we're, we're normal. I mean, they're running around, and uh, uh, we didn't see anything like microcephaly or obvious heart deficits or defects um, upon, uh, upon autopsy. And their fee levels, by the time we got in there and got, got to measure them, were, were normal because it was about six hours after birth they um, Steve can test this, but it was about 3 a.m. when the, the piglets were born and we rushed in and, and tried to, to get the blood measurements and there was stillbirth going on and it's a mess. Um, so um, we got the, the blood fee measurements probably a little bit late, uh, but you can imagine that, um, I mean, the, the mother was at, at you know, 2,500 micromolar. So th these guys were, the piglets were really being bathed in, in very high fee concentrations. And unless there's something incredibly different in, in the transplacental transport of, of phenylalanine itself in pigs, um, they, they would have, uh, uh, we were expecting to have a, a much more severe phenotype. Um, so the fact that we're not getting uh, overt neurological or neurobehavioral phenotypes, maybe it's more subtle in the PKU pigs. Or, or that there's something genetically different uh, that's going on. And so right now um, we're working, uh, uh, I'm doing some uh, uh, post uh, analysis on uh, the maternal PKU litter. Uh, we're also bringing back the, the PKU pigs using somatic cell nuclear transfer. So taking the neonatal fibroblasts from the, from the affected and the heterozygous founding animals and uh, putting them in, into a, a an oocyte or a fertilized egg uh, in, a, in a pig and, and, and recreating them. Um, and this is work um, that's being partnered with um, uh, Nestle Health Science and Codexis for uh, uh, an ammonial IA study. And um, so uh, with that, I, hopefully I have a little bit of time. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, I also wanted to switch gears just to tell you a little bit about a different model that I was been working on. So this is a a liver hepatocarcinoma cell line, a HEPG2, in which I've also made a CRISPR-Cas9 mediated deletion of uh, the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene, uh, targeting exons two to 12. So it's a pretty big 75 kb deletion, where, whereas in the pig, I was, we were making about a, a two kb deletion uh, kilobases. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the HEPG2 model, um, I see I generated three separate clonal deletion lines and um, similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Dobrowski was telling us about, uh, I did a, a mitochondrial bioenergetic study and found uh, there was actually an increase in, in respiration rate in the PKU cells. Uh, keep in mind, this is in liver cells, whereas his deficits are being seen in, in, in brain and neuronal cells and in um, muscle, or sorry, uh, bone uh, uh, progenitor cells. Um, Sorry, mesenchymal stem cells. So here we're, uh, I was also seeing there's actually higher mitochondrial content and reduced reactive oxygen species production. Um, and this was kind of with one clonal line, so I'm still working to, to kind of verify it. And then I moved on to do uh, a gene expression study. Uh, so this is a heat map in, of uh, all the genes in the human, uh, the, yeah, the human uh, 
genome being expressed um, and looking at which ones are up and down regulated. And so there's uh, unique profiles uh, and comparative of genotypes and in doing uh, treating these cells with either a normal fee with about 200 micromolar or versus treating them with uh, 1200 micromolar. And uh, there's some overlap, actually a good deal of overlap between those in genotype and between uh, hyperphenylanemia conditions. Uh, interestingly, the uh, phenylamine metabolism gene set kind of came out in uh, a post-analysis and this included, uh, of course, a family and hydroxylase, but also uh, tyrosine amino transferase and uh, uh, amine oxidase as well, I think. Uh, so some interesting things. And then I'm taking that cell line and trying to introduce patient-specific mutations uh, using a, another CRISPR method. This is with a template to rescue or to knock in um, either the, a wild type or uh, a patient variant. Uh, so here I was actually uh, trying to cut intron one and then put in, to put in a, a gene cassette uh, that contains phenylalanine hydroxylase fused to a, a GFP reporter and into the uh, endogenous three prime UTR so that it, it gets kind of expressed at a normal level. And uh, we had some decent success. Uh, um, I mean, it's a little bit low efficiency and um, and the work is still ongoing. I'm also working on using prime editing to induce or correct uh, the more common R408 mutations. So uh, this is uh, using a CRISPR technology where kind of instead of making a cut, you're making a, a nick in the DNA and then using a reverse transcriptase uh, to generate a template to do repair. Um, and uh, it's hard, a little hard to see, but in the bottom, the panel panels, there's this kind of a, quadrant of uh, droplet digital droplets that are positive in the, the top left that occurs when you, when you generate the mutation. Um, oh, and I should mention that uh, I've also done some uh, just simple plasmid expressions using the PHC DNA with variants and the GFP to uh, generate the pH specific models. And the idea there is to then be able to test different small molecule therapies, uh, chaperonins or, or something like sepiotarin, see how well different uh, variants respond in uh, alone and in combinations um, as uh, most patients are, are compound heterozygous. And so there's kind of this idea of interallelic uh, complementation. Uh, with that, I just wanna uh, thank everyone here um, and the NPKUA for supporting my research um, and uh, my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh and at the University of Missouri. Thank you. Next, Carrie Harding. There is a pointer on the. On the on here, right? On that, yep. So thanks. I'm Dr. Carrie Harding from just across the river or in Portland at Oregon Health and Science University. And uh, I'm very grateful for the funding that we've had for several years now um, for National PK Alliance. A lot of our uh, gene editing work has been really solely uh, funded by uh, NPKUA. Um, these are my objectives. I want to briefly discuss uh, what's been done past in the lab and is now in the clinic, gene addition therapy, and then talk about, and Eric's done a nice job of uh, introducing CRISPR-Cas uh, and how we used that to make a new mouse model. He used it to make a pig. We made a new mouse. And then how we used it to, to uh, uh, treat the PKU mouse, and then talk about some of the limitations of that technology and, and uh, what we're doing moving forward. And my uh, graduate student, Michael Martinez, has a talk tomorrow uh, to talk more about that work. Um, so this is really what I wanna talk about, which is liver-directed genetic therapies. Everyone knows that PKU is caused by the fact that you have two mutations in your PAH genes. One, we have two genes, one, each one has to have a mutation in it or a variant in it. And um, that causes you to have a, variant messenger RNA and you end up with either a dysfunctional PAH protein or no PAH protein. So you can't take phenylalanine and, and, and make tyrosine from it. And we wanna intervene in this uh, someplace. And um, uh, the thing that most people have worked on for many, many, many years now is uh, gene addition. And the sexiest thing that 
most labs have worked on is to simply add a copy back of the PAH gene back into the liver cells. So this doesn't actually do anything to the animal or the patient's own PAH gene. It's just adding a new copy um, to this, uh, you know, to the cells. Um, so the way this really works and the vogue way of doing this mostly is with a virus called adeno-associated virus. The flavor that we use is AAV8 in mice. There's different uh, flavors used in clinical trials, but we have a virus that's carrying the PAH gene. This is a little picture of it. It's these little tiny, the little tiny particles in the micrograph here are the AAVs. And we inject those intravenously and they travel to the liver and they carry in the PAH gene, which make PAH protein. So the important note, thing to notice here is that we haven't done anything to the patient's own genes. We're just adding in a copy. So that's why it's called gene addition. So we did this a long time ago now, and we weren't the only ones. There's several labs that achieved this in PKU mice. Um, this was back our publication back in 2006. We do this in PKU mice about a week later, their blood fees are basically normal. And uh, Eric has always already shown this picture from our publication where we took tan mice on the left because elevated blood fee causes your, uh, them to have a little bit less melanin production. They're not albino, but they're tan and they should be black. And if we lower their blood fees, they turn black. So we don't even need to do their fee levels. We can pretty much figure out who's been cured by just looking in the cage. Uh, we see their black color come back. So what's taken so long to get this into the clinic was really trying to figure out uh, if this was safe or not. Uh, and uh, uh, understanding the risks of doing this kind of therapy. And so we had to basically wait for this to be done in other diseases that were probably more life threatening um, and I've had the pleasure uh, of being involved in a clinical trial of exactly this, this virus, but switching out the gene for OTC, ornithine transcarbamylase. We've done a clinical trial in adults with this disorder and have successfully treated without any major safety complications, 11 uh, adults so far. And this is going on into a phase three clinical trial. Um, and we weren't the only trial that's done AAV gene therapy, uh, uh, but it's the, the one I've been involved in. And so since then, there are now two different AAV gene therapy trials that are going on for PKU, one by Homology Medicines, one by Biomarin. They each have their own flavor of AAV. They're slightly different in terms of the coding, and they're slightly different in how they've de designed their gene. Um, neither have published any data. So this is the information that's been publicly released in terms of the, the patients that have been dosed, and there's been at least some early promising responses. So why am I uh, going on to do other things? Well, there's some disadvantages to this approach. So I showed you that the gene that we've stuck in there doesn't actually really interact with the genes of the patient. So they remain as what we call episomes. And if the cells divide, those episomes get tossed out. So we know that if we did this treatment in children, it would be rapidly lost because the liver's growing. If we do this in baby mice, it's, I'm sorry, it's gone in about two days. Um, and so we can't do this in children. And that's a big question is how long this will last if we do this in adults. Uh, it's been stable for as long as four years in our OTC trial, and there have been patients with other diseases out 10 years. But the truth is we don't really absolutely know how long it'll be in adults. And if we have to do a large dose of these viruses, there are complications from that. And there's also a concern that even though I haven't shown you that these viruses can stick their genes in our genes. There's a concern that they do that. And is that in any way risky? Can that basically give liver cancer? So there's this ongoing question about that problem. So we are also working on this approach, which is gene correction. And this is really the project that NPKUA has funded. And that is how can we actually change the patient's gene back to normal? Uh, and we've used CRISPR to do this job. So this is basically like gene surgery, if you will. But even people working in the field of CRISPR, I think, have gotten a little bit of confusion about what CRISPR does. CRISPR doesn't really do gene correction itself. All CRISPR can do is make a cut in the DNA. So the way we do this, we take the same virus, but now instead of putting in PAH, we've put in the gene for this enzyme called Cas9, which Eric has already talked to you about, comes from bacteria. And Cas9 goes in, and I'm leaving out some of the parts here just for simplifica simplification. But the Cas9, we've designed it to target 
a very specific site in the genome, very close to where the PAH mutation is at. And it goes in and it can make a cut there. I'm just showing it cutting where we were in, in one of the two genes, but it can cut both. It doesn't, it cuts them, but just for simplification, I'm just showing the one. And that's what the magic of Cas9 is. It, CRISPR Cas9, it can go in, find the spot you want and make a cut at that spot and hopefully just that spot. But that's all it does. It doesn't cure the disease. In fact, it makes it worse. It's just cut the gene out. And that's exactly what Eric did was he made a, made a pig by cutting out its PAH gene. And we've gone on actually Dalen Richards, who you've, many of you have met before as a graduate student who's got her PhD in my lab is now in medical school. Um, she used this to make a new PKU mouse, which she published back in 2020. I'm not gonna go through this data, but basically she cut out the upstream end of the PAH gene to make a new PKU mouse. Why, why did we need a new PKU mouse? Um, basically, it helped us be able to track when we treated the liver. The existing PKU mouse, the ENU2 mouse, has PAH protein in its liver, but it's um, uh, not active. So it still has PKU, but it has tons of protein. So if we put the gene in the liver of the ENU2 mouse, we can't track it because there's already protein in there and we can't tell the difference between the protein it had and the protein we gave it. This new animal doesn't have any protein. So down here in the, on the lower right, this is a liver section from that animal. In, in green would be the PAH protein, but it doesn't have any. And if we give it gene therapy, the liver turns green. So now this animal is very useful for us because we can track when we've actually given it back PAH protein, and we can count how many cells we've actually been able to correct. So we've used Cas9 in this, in this project to make a new mouse that just really helps us be able to know how successful we've been in our gene therapy trials. But we haven't cured the animal, we've made it have PKU. So what do we have to do next to actually cure this hole that we've made? We have to actually add a second virus, and now that delivers part of the PAH gene. And what we're hoping is that the cell will use that to help heal the hole. And that's a process that's called homologous recombination. And if it does that right, it fills in and we've filled it in with a piece that has the normal sequence, not we've let, you know, we've corrected it. We haven't put in the mutation. So hopefully now this corrected gene will make normal PAH activity. So Dalen has done this. Um, the issue is, that there are two repair mechanisms in cells. And the one on the right, that's NHEJ, non-homologous end joining, is the pathway that the liver would prefer to use, which is it would just like to take the ends of the hole and stick them back together again and fill it in, and that doesn't do anything for us. That doesn't correct anything. And what we wanted to do is the pathway on the left, which is HDR, or homology directed repair, which is to use our little piece of the PAH gene and fill in the hole with a new sequence. And what we found is the liver would prefer to go the right, go to the right and just fix the hole and not and ignore our new piece. And that doesn't, that leaves you with PKU. And she had to actually use a trick. She had to give the animals vanillin, which is actually the stuff that makes vanilla, vanilla-y, if you will. Um, and if you give mice vanillin, it actually forces the cells to use more HDR. And I don't have time to go into the mechanism about why that happens. But if she did that, uh, when she gave animals, uh, I don't know why that didn't work. Sorry. So um, maybe, I'll, maybe I can use the pointer here. Um, sorry for the people on that side of the room. Uh, so over here on the on-target repair in this column where it says DAV plus vanillin, these are the animals that got both viruses and vanillin. And in blue here, and that's over here on that side, those are the animals that got um, roughly about 20% uh, uh, of their uh, genomes incorporated the PAH gene like it was supposed to. And that gave us about 10% enzyme activity. And that dropped their blood fee levels down from around 1500 down to on average about 600. So not quite down to the treatment target, but we did get a few animals 
down below uh, 360, which is the red line, and one that was down almost to 120, which is normal for a mouse, which is the black line. So not complete normal, not correction down completely to normal, but certainly a big difference from, from where they were um, untreated. But we uh, ha have not completely um, corrected them you know, uniformly. So there are some CRISPR trials going on in humans. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but none of them are repair. All of them are just knocking out genes. So there's, there's blood trials, there is a lung cancer trial, there's a blindness trial going on at our place at OHSU. Uh, and the only liver trial, which has been a very successful trial, is one uh, going on that's knocking out a gene in the liver and that's working very well. But again, it's not repairing a gene that's yet to be attempted in humans to my, to my knowledge. And it's that repair part that's much more difficult. Uh, and that's really the focus of where my lab's gone now is to try to figure out how to make those repairs more frequent. So what we're finding in our work, which we've published now, is that the, this frequency of getting the repair, the gene correction, is probably just slightly too low to be completely curative. So what do we have to do to make it curative? We either have to get more than you know, eight or 10% of the cells to get these corrections, we either have to get that initial gene correction to go up, and Michael Martinez is gonna talk more about that uh, on, on uh, tomorrow. Or the other thing that could be useful is if we could figure out a way to get those liver cells that have gotten a gene correction to grow faster than the rest of the liver and expand to become a population that's bigger and make more PAH, so that's called a select, selective growth advantage. If we could get that to happen, then even if we only corrected a few cells, those cells might grow to become a population that would be bigger and, and ultimately be curative. And that's gonna be the subject of uh, the next talk. You'll hear from Anne about her work. Um, so uh, the other problem that we have is that the approach that we just showed you only corrected that single mutation, targeted that mutation in that single animal. And there's over a thousand different PAH mutation, mutations that we know about. And so technically we'd have to make a thousand different reagents and that would be a tough sell to the FDA. So we are also working on a new approach where instead of just inserting a tiny piece of the PAH gene where we're targeting one mutation, we're trying to insert basically an entire copy of the full PAH gene so that that would work for any patient with any mutation. But, um, and we have a poster on this. Uh, we've had some early success with it, but we aren't even getting quite the levels down to 600. We've gotten down to about 900 or 1000. So that we have a poster on that that you can see that should be up by now. Um, and so we also have to improve that, but that's just a little bit harder, even getting a bigger piece of DNA to, to be inserted into the genome, but we're making some progress there as well. Uh, finally, this obviously takes a, uh, uh, and I don't even have a fraction of the people that really were involved here, but uh, an army of people to do all this work. And again, I'm, we're extremely grateful for the funding from NPKUA over the years, and thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Harding. And next we have a PhD student, Anne. All right, uh, thank you. My name is Anne Veneta and I am a uh, PhD candidate right across the river at OHSU. Um, and I'm going to be presenting some work that I've done alongside my mentor, Dr. Mar Marcus Grompe, um, on a cell therapy method for PKU. There it is. Okay, so we are interested in applying a method known as hepatocyte transplantation to PKU. Um, so this is a cell therapy method um, wherein uh, liver cells or hepatocytes are taken from a donor liver uh, they are dissociated into single cells, and these cells are then delivered by an IV um, infusion uh, into a recipient patient. 
Um, and in the patient, the, some of these cells can then take up residence or engraft in the liver um, where they can um, support liver function um, and uh, carry out metabolic processes. Um, so if we take a donor liver from an individual that does not have PKU or is able to metabolize fee, um, and we deliver those cells to a PKU patient, uh, the, those donor cells can uh, support the PKU liver by metabolizing fee. Um, and we know from animal studies, as well as a few clinical trials, um, that these engrafted cells are able to bring down blood fee levels. Um, and we also know that if we can get enough engrafted cells, we can bring down blood fee levels into the totally healthy range. Um, however, a problem or one main problem that's really um, prevented this from being applied clinically um, is the low efficiency of this uh, engraftment process. Um, we know that what's usually achievable um, with this hepatocyte transplantation method um, is for around 1% of the patient's liver to be replaced by these uh, engrafted cells. Um, and we also know from animal studies that what we need to bring blood fee levels uh, down to the totally healthy range is around 10% of the liver to be replaced with the metabolizing cells. Um, so we theorized uh, that uh, one way to address this problem would be to create a selective growth advantage for our transplanted cells. So how this would work um, we'd be, would be that we would start with a liver that receives a small number of transplanted cells, as is currently possible, um, and then we would then provide a stimulus to cause these cells to divide and divide and divide again until they make up enough of the liver to bring down those blood fee levels um, to the healthy range. Um, however, there's nothing inherently different about these cells that allows this selective expansion to occur. Uh, so we wanted to create um, some system that would give an artificial selective advantage to these cells uh, to allow this selective expansion of the transplanted hepatocytes to allow us to achieve enough of the liver, enough liver replacement uh, to correct blood fee levels. Um, and we devised a system based on a drug that we probably all have in our medicine cabinets at home, um, acetaminophen, which is often uh, better known by its brand name, which is Tylenol. Um, so acetaminophen at the doses that we've probably all taken it is completely fine for you, um, but uh, acetaminophen at very high doses is metabolized in hepatocytes uh, to a toxic compound uh, that is uh, toxic, uh, toxic to the cells and can result in cell death. Um, and this is happening in hepatocytes because they express a gene called Cypor um, that is breaking down acetaminophen into this toxic metabolite. Um, however, cells that do not express this Cypor gene are not susceptible to acetaminophen toxicity because they are not breaking down the acetaminophen. So they are protected from acetaminophen toxicity. So what this means is that when we have a liver that's mostly comprised of sensitive or Cypor expressing hepatocytes with some small population of transplanted hepatocytes that are, don't have Cypor, or in other words, are resistant to acetaminophen, we can selectively expand those rare Cypor negative resistant cells by treating with acetaminophen, and those cells will proliferate to uh, replace the dying cells um, as, uh, as uh, acetaminophen selection is ongoing. Um, so to prove that this could work um, to, uh, as a therapeutic for PKU, I used a PKU mouse model. Um, so in this experiment, what I started with was a donor um, mouse that has a functional PAH gene, or in other words, this donor mouse does not have PKU. I uh, took the liver from this animal and isolated the hepatocytes and treated those in a dish um, with components of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system that are designed to break the Cypor gene. So we've talked a lot now about CRISPR and its role in both fixing and breaking genes. So in this case, we are breaking um, the Cypor gene. So we now have these cells that have two components that are of interest to us. They're PAH positive or able to metabolize phi, so they can be therapeutic for PKU. And they're also Cypor negative, so they can be selected by acetaminophen treatment. 
So these cells then get injected um, into a PKU mouse uh, using an injection strategy um, that we know is going to allow these cells to travel to the liver and engraft. And then we treat these mice with acetaminophen to selectively grow up these cells um, and try and bring down the blood fee levels in these animals. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the, the blood fee levels in these animals throughout the experiment. So this first time point um, is after, cell, or after mice have received the cell injection, but before they've received any acetaminophen, we see uh, highly elevated blood fee levels above 1500 micromolar, which is pretty characteristic for this um, PKU mouse model. Uh, how after, however, after they receive acetaminophen, and in this case, um, I've kept them on acetaminophen, an acetaminophen-containing diet for about 50 days, um, what we see in these mice is that these blood fee levels come down to around 200 micromolar, um, uh, which is considered completely uh, corrected. And I should mention that these mice are being maintained on a, a standard chow with no protein restriction at this time. Um, so we expect that this reduction in blood fee level is, um, is due to the expansion of those PAH expressing cells in the liver. Um, and we confirm this by looking in the livers of these animals. Um, and we can see here, um, in, in this case, red is marking the cells that originated from that donor animal, or in other words, th these are the PAH expressing cells. Um, and you can see the presence of these large clusters uh, or clonal expansions of these cells from the donor animal. So, uh, and these are the cells that are most expressing PAH and are responsible for bring bringing down those blood fee levels. And when we quantify these red cells um, that are from the donor animal, um, we see that they account for um, around 16% of the liver, uh, which we know is well more than we could achieve with a standard hepatocyte transplantation um, uh, without acetaminophen selection. So it is this clonal expansion of the transplanted hepatocytes by acetaminophen um, that has allowed us uh, to correct the blood fee levels um, in these PKU mice. Um, so I'll be talking more on this tomorrow morning um, if you're interested, but just to summarize the takeaway of these, this presentation, um, we've shown that acetaminophen selection of transplanted hepatocytes um, can correct blood fee levels um, in a PKU mouse model. Uh, and just briefly, I'd like to thank everyone in the Grampe lab, especially my mentor, Dr. Marcus Grampe, as well as everyone in the Harding lab. Um, and uh, especially a big thank you to the NPKUA uh, for funding this research. And Dr. Yano, this is the pointer. <laughs> Hello. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Dr. Shoji, and I'm US, from USC. And then uh, so we're going to start. Wow, well, this is, I hope you can read it. Um, this is about LNA, large neutral amino acid therapy affects the, well, how um, neurotrans, well, neuropsych symptoms and then LNA, you know, how that don't. Um, improves and then also um, um, evaluation of a neurotransmitter, how LNA, large neutral amino acid affects. So we'd like to make that you know, connection. Um, we have been using um, in our clinic, um, large neutral amino acid preclinol for adult PQ patients since 2000, uh, which was actually introduced by Dr. Richard Koch. And then, um, you know, large neutral amino acid therapy does not necessarily always decrease feed level, so that's why. Maybe that's the reason. Um, I do not know how many clinics are actually using um, uh, LNA treatment for adults, particularly. And then, uh, but then, based on um, uh, their um, change in the mood, better in the mood. And then less anxiety, less depression. So we, um, as a treating physician, um, medical care provider feels that no, it is indeed working, even though feed level do not necessarily goes down. So um, we were thinking about something to do with the neurotransmitter 
improves with large neutral amino acid. So, um, let's see. Um, PKU is, of course, you know, um, people know that, that due to deficiency of uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is expressed in the liver, not expressed in the brain to begin with. So a uh, symptom of PKU is something brain dysfunction, but then there's no defects to begin with. So there has to be high blood fee going into brain is the cause of the problem, the brain. So um, how does that work? So then um, high fee actually affects other amino acid transport into brain. And um, that basically leading to neurotransmitter deficiency. And um, large neutral, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, phenylalanine itself, high phenylalanine itself could uh, have some effect in CNS, of course, but then tryptophan and then tyrosine, those are precursors of neurotransmitter, dopamine and the serotonin are low, which is known actually. And then um, the blood brain barrier has um, something called LAT1 transporter, which allows large neutral amino acid into go to a brain from blood, but then entrance is the same entrance. So then if lots of fee around then tyrosine and tryptophan lose the chance to get into brain and then result in low serotonin and the dopamine. That's, we are talking about only serotonin and dopamine, but then those are not the only neurotransmitters. There are many others. Let's see. Um, so, uh, Okay. So this is LAT1, and then a lot of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and then tryptophan cannot get go through LAT1. So that's what we are talking about. So then tyrosine goes to dopamine, and then tryptophan goes to serotonin, and then 5-hydroxyindroacetic acid, and then melatonin. And then I put it, I don't know, PAH here, but then, you know, this is occurs in liver only. There's no PAH in the brain. So phi has to go somewhere, back here, phenyl ethramine. And this is um, structurally very similar to amphetamine or Adderall. So exposure of this stimulant for chronic long-term, very high dose, naturally cause problem. So then um, let's see. we um, did study um, with, with adult PKU patients and uh, showed LNNA uh, supplementation improved dopamine and the serotonin. That was published in, in 2013. And then, but at that time we couldn't do neuropsychological evaluation um, after LNA supplementation you know, gets better or gets you no know, no change, we we didn't do um, evaluation. And then uh, recently, Italian group, uh, Dr. Scala et al. reported in 2020 <clears throat> um, that you know, LNA supplementation improved neuropsychological performance in adult PKU, but then they didn't do um, evaluation with neurotransmitter. So we have a, like a para evidence, but there's no really direct evidence you know, shown. Let's see. So we um, uh, measured this melatonin, and then this coming from serotonin, but then this pathway occurs in the brain. So that's why we can, now speculate that no, this measurement is directly um, 
fine, you know, it can be evaluated, evaluating that you know, CNS serotonin synthesis. Yeah. And then this, um, this shows, um, this is phenylalanine blood concentration, and then urine melatonin, serotonin metabolites, urine 6 alpha toxin melatonin. So then let's see, red circle, this point was ob obtained when the patient are on LNA supplementation. So it's a little bit hard to see it, but no, um, let's say this triangle here, 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 here. So then LNA treatment will make feed a little bit lower and then serotonin goes high. And then um, this is the trend. And then another point uh, I would like to, you to see it is there are so many variations. Each specific marker will specify a specific patient, but then um, even, oh, let's see, feedable of 1,000 micromolar. Some normal is about 10 to like a 30, 40, between 10 to 30-ish is normal. Somebody can have a normal level, but then some are high, and then these people low in serotonin in the brain, but then somebody who has very high fees, still very high in you know, serotonin, melatonin. So it's really, we just cannot use uh, plasma feedable and then speculate what's going on in serotonin metabolism in the brain. It's impossible to actually speculate. So I have to measure it. And then which is possible to, now. This, this is, um, uh, we ch I changed the X axis, fee and then large neutral amino acid you know, a ratio. And then this correlation, a negative correlation looks more cleaner. What this means is at LAT1, competition is actually, you know, we can see it from this graph. Higher fee and then serotonin goes down. That's what it is. So this is um, um, something called phenylethylamine. Um, I just briefly mentioned before, phenyl iron, uh, decarboxylase, make uh, phenyl ethylamine, and then um, this is like um, amphetamine kind of you know, chemicals. And then phenyl iron up to like a 900-ish, normal level is less than 50, so then normal, 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 and then above like a 900-ish, let's go high. So this um, is showing um, what we did in, in the past study. So this is a patient control, and then myself is one of the control, and then Catherine also. <laughs> so there's uh, six alpha toximeratonin control adult, and then dopamine control. And then this is a um, washout for three weeks of um, um, no um, in dietary intervention in PK patient. And the very low in melatonin, meaning brain serotonin. And then this is dopamine level in the patient with dopamine, it's also urine. And then after large neutral amino acid therapy, this is improved. So we, we knew that no large neutral amino acid improves at least serotonin and the dopamine and your transmitter. Um, see this then. So what we know about neurotransmitter metabolism in PKU, there may be more, uh, many more actually, uh, neurotransmitter besides dopamine and serotonin that are deviated from 
normal physiology, in particular the out of control PKU individuals, we showed significant variability in neurotransmitter levels, even at a similar blood feed level among adults with PKU. Feed levels cannot be used to evaluate CNS neurotransmitter metab metabolism due to wide individual variation. And then uh, also we showed LNA, LNAA improved dopamine and melatonin levels in adult PKU. So we, what we has not been clearly reported or documented is the evidence of a connection between neurotransmitter metabolism abnormality and neuropsychological symptoms seen in individual with PKU. So, I lost my time, but how many minutes more? Okay. So, um, so um, establishing a connection between neuropsychological symptoms and the neurotransmitter metabolism variety is the aim of this study with the use of LNAA. And then uh, this is enrollment criteria. Six adult with PKU with two or more uh, PKU related symptoms who are naive to LNNA, BH4, and palinzic are possible candidates with additional criteria shown in this slide. And then uh, this slide, and then next slide shows actually uh, six patients undergo three cycles of a, a placebo active crossover study, total of um, 18 weeks. And then let's see. Multiple method of, let's see. Oh, no, no. Before I can go back, go back. Yeah. Okay, so a multiple episode, um, multiple method uh, will be used for neuropsychological evaluation shown in the slide. And then blood amino acid and not feed level, tyrosine level only, blood whole amino acid and the urine neurotransmitter will also be evaluated at the end of each period. And then uh, conclusion, total of six adults with PKU participated in the end of one randomized control study to attempt to de determine that LNA supplementation can improve PKU-related neuropsychological symptoms as well as neurotransmitter metabolism abnormalities. But we cannot be used to evaluate neurotransmitter metabolism due to individual variation. And that this study may provide critical information of measurable peripheral neurotransmitter biomarkers, which can be used for individualized precise uh, precision treatment for patients with PKU. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all for giving us your updates on your research. And we do have some time for some questions. I know for those that this is your first uh, presentation of the research, it's going to be very overwhelming. And <laughs> you may not know what to ask, but they, they are going to be around here. And we do have also a lot of the posters will be start started to be um, in the room and I wanna make sure everybody can go visit all the posters, which are just a summary of the research that's being done. So, but for now, does anybody have any questions that they'd like from the panel? Yeah. John. There are uh, definitely companies uh, interested in uh, commercializing hepatocyte transplantation in general. I don't know that any of those are currently have PKU specifically um, in in mind, um, but there are there are uh, companies that are definitely working on 
various ways to grow up hepatocytes uh, as a source material um, that will be going into clinical trials quite soon. Good. So there Question. have been two adults with PKU that have had hepatocyte transplants at Pittsburgh, uh, but they had very few cells. This is Anne's problem that she's attacking. They had very few cells that actually engrafted and I don't know exact numbers in terms of how low their fees dropped, but that's precisely the issue. Maybe Steve knows more about. Uh, yeah, Carrie, I, I did the um, assessment on the liver biopsies for engrafting cells in those uh, hepatocyte infused patients. And uh, well, there were a few there. Um, few is the really the relevant term in this. Um, it was the first time. So if this can be improved upon by uh, selection as one of the speakers here described or, uh, or other means, uh, time will tell. I, mean, I, was, I was involved in a trial for not again PKU, but urea cycle disorders where we did transplants in babies, but we did it like four days in a row because the limitation is you can only put so many cells in the blood vessels into the liver every day or they clog up and then you kill the liver and it's, you know, that's bad. Um, so, and even that we struggle to get enough in to have any impact. So it's just getting in enough cells to do anything. So whatever we can do to expand that population, I think is really critical to get that to work. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, it's really analogous to what's being done for bone marrow transplant. So in a bone marrow transplant, you take out, you, you know, you kill someone's bone marrow and then you replace it with normal bone marrow. And yes, there's some toxicities associated with that, but you really have to think about this as being exactly analogous to that. So kind of on a related question, back here in the back, if you're looking for me. <laughs> Like uh, so when you're looking at the hepatocyte transplantation, do you, do you think that any of the limitations of grafting or low numbers are due to an autoimmune response and auto rejection? And could you pair that with the editing where you actually remove hepatocytes from the individual that is also the recipient, perform the edits, grow those up and then retransplant? And would you then be able to both overcome an autoimmune response? as well as potentially increase the grafting efficiency? Uh, yes, I, I believe that that would be a, a viable strategy and especially with using acetaminophen selection as that would obviously, you know, limit your cell source relative to an aloe transplant. But I think acetaminophen selection could allow that to work. Um, so yes, and then another, um, element of the immunology of hepatocyte transplant is that also recently uh, universal donor hepatocytes have been described um, by a, a company that my PI is involved with um, that uh, will also help to address, that may help to address if they uh, are proved uh, clinically relevant, may help to address that, um, that immunological aspect of it. So, yes. When you say universal donor, are they actually universal or is it more like a universal blood donor where it's just less likely to injure somebody than the wrong type? Does it? Um, they lack, uh, they basically lack HLA, HLA expression and, and express a decoy HLA. So I, I'm not an immunologist, but I believe they're fairly truly universal. Okay, cool. And then one other, if I, if I may, one other follow-up. You mentioned, I think, earlier in your talk about the hepatocytes having a, a growth advantage, but as you, as you progressed, it's just a selective advantage, right? Because of that non-production of the toxin. You're not actually, right. they're yeah. not growing any faster or you know unregulated or, or anything in terms of that way, right? Correct. Yeah, I guess a growth advantage is maybe a misnomer, but basically the, of, the other sensitive hepatocytes are dying and because of the prolifer proliferative nature of the liver, the ones that are going to expand to replace them are our transplanted um, hepatocytes that are not susceptible. Awesome. So cool.
Any other questions that I see? I want to point out that in the animal experiments, it's they're all congenic, right? So the limitations that we're seeing are not immune, but um, clearly you'd have to worry about immune issues then. And that, and that was an issue, I think, in the hepatocyte transplants. I think they did have issues maintaining. They, they obviously were doing immunosuppression, but, and I don't, I mean, I've talked to Ira Fox about this a couple of times. I think they weren't sure it was as effective as when they do immunosuppression for when they do whole organ transplant. So, that, so there's that additional limitation when we start talking about doing human transplants. But it, it's just, you know, it doesn't work very well in mice, even when you don't have the immunologic issues. So there's clearly other limitations. We had a question back here. Uh, yes, this is for Dr. Dober, Dober Walski. Uh, the, in the senescence literature, there's some use, you know, two things that you said. One, about the oxidative stress. So one question is, in the senescent literature, ALS literature, people have used nanoparticle curcumin to get in through the blood-brain barrier, and it's been effective in ALS in uh, two-year studies and even with some plaque regression. Is that something, that approach, something that we should be doing now with our PKU patients? And then the second aspect is there's a lot of look sales for NAD supplementation to decrease aging. And are there any of these, quote, NAD supplements that could improve the NAD levels in the brain? Um, a very worthy pair of questions. Uh, regarding NAD supplements, I would run from that. Um, we're not, I, I think NAD would not be the way to go, but the route would be through um, tissue specific, even cell specific um, energy substrate repletion. But, um, you know, regarding, you know, um, treatment now, um, regarding the uh, antioxidative management, uh, I think before you can move forward with something like that in any new disease system, which of course PKU would be a new disease system, would require um, quite a bit of investigation up front. Um, it's tempting to say, you know, it worked here, let's do it now. Um, but it, it's just simply not that. Uh, not that easy, and, and, and rightly so. But um, have we investigated antioxidants? Well, the answer is absolutely we have. Um, I'm not going to present any of that data tomorrow. I decided, I mean, I'm, I'm just sticking to the energy substrates end of it, though we have looked at this, and there has been promising data. And uh, and like anything, when it's promising, you have to work it up and uh, really get the veracity, uh, you know, absolutely solid. And so, yeah, it's very tempting to want to do things now, but that's not how science and medicine work. Thank you. Did I see another hand? There's a hand right here. So I'm a grad student lab with Barry Harding. So we sometimes wondered if we're able to effectively treat a mouse as a neonate, whether it would still have a low brain Well, as I'm sure I know Carrie knows, and I'm betting you know, <laughs> that working with um, MPKU system in our C57 based mouse model, we're using the same mouse, um, is nearly impossible because of the, well, the, the female uh, PKU mice are poorly maternal on a good day. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, we, uh, I threw it out there in a grant application that would pull them out at, you know, E18 or E19 and put them on surrogates and eh, it didn't get funded, but, um, 
sure. I mean, I'm certainly well, you know, with the pig model, we might have, a, you know, a better approach with that. Uh, and, you know, we're probably going to be back in the pig business before the end of the year. So, uh, so we'll talk that. <laughs> Uh, not a question, just a statement that I wanted to make with all of you up on the board here now that, you know, while I personally might not possess the vocabulary to completely appreciate everything that was portrayed here, although I did seem to follow along with what you were uh, putting out there, that as a parent with a child with PKU that well, the understanding might not be completely there, the appreciation for your daily efforts to try to help our families is something that uh, is, is ever present. So thank you very much for your help. And with that, we thank you all again.